evening, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, talk. Today, we'll be talking about how we are linking ESG. ESG stands for Environment, Social and Governance. ESG performance to shipping. In this uh, <clears throat> period that we are uh, moving forward, we have the, let's say, big challenges of decarbonization, digitization, uh, diversification, have a lot of challenges across the market. And um, we have the recent, let's say, buzzword of ESG. ESG is impacting decisions in maritime stakeholders, along with the emerging contractual and regulatory requirements across the market. Shipping industry needs not only to communicate, but to engage with effective strategy towards sustainable shipping. So we would like to uh, discuss today what changes are being, let's say, brought forward by ESG, <clears throat> what the market uh, will be, let's say, responding, um, how are the, let's say, changing priorities for the society and the business are impacting the stakeholders across the market, and so on and so forth. In order to do that, we have uh, uh, assembled a panel of uh, uh, global experts, I would say. Let me introduce them. We start with uh, Nicole Reconret. Uh, Nicole is the sustainability and is with Sustainability and Shipping Initiative. Um, and he, she's head of partnerships and development. We have uh, Bjorn Howland. Bjorn is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Norway 203040. We have Stavros Maidani. Stavros is the Chief Sustainability Officer of the Capital Group, a listed, a listed group of companies and also Managing Director of the Capital Executive. And uh, last but not least, we have John Kogias. John is from the commercial part of the business. Uh, he is a ship broker. He is working with exclusive ship brokers uh, at Projects in Finance. And among other things, he is the chairman of the Hellenic Ship Broker Association. I would like to uh, welcome you all. And I would like to start right away. And I would like to hear from you with our, let's say, first discussion point. And I would like to ask you, what are the key ESG challenges surrounding shipping amid COVID-19? What needs to be addressed in the post-COVID era? And what are your views towards that end? Let's start with uh, Nicole. Nicole, let's hear from you. Thanks, Apostolos, and thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I think we can start off just by talking about um, the ESG and the journey to the sustainable shipping industry. Um, it requires commitment and action that, uh, that at times really needs to go beyond regulatory um, action, which you mentioned earlier in your introduction, Apostolos. And I think um, COVID-19 has really shone a light on um, some systemic issues in, uh, in shipping around uh, seafarers' labor and human rights. Um, what we've seen is um, different stakeholder groups. We've seen charters, we've seen financial sector who are, um, increasingly demonstrating their interest in addressing the, the S in the ESG, um, which is fantastic because that hasn't always been the case. Um, and this is all in the name of protecting and delivering on, on the, the seafarers' rights, our seafarers that are, that are the backbone of our, of our supply chains. Okay. Um, thank you, Nicole. Um, John, your views? Thank you, and uh, thank you for for a kind invitation to participate here. Uh, we, we are definitely into uh, an era and a century of, of big transformations. And um, from where I am coming now, I, I work with DNVGL for many years and, and in, in depth in the shipping industry, but in my, my recent position, I'm, I'm working broadly with companies across sectors working on decarbonizations. And, I would say within the financial sector, it has probably happened more the last 12 months than it have happened the last 12 years in how they look at ESG performance and how they look at risk. And, and I think that is a very strong signal to the shipping sector that uh, the financial uh, community and the financial instruments going forward will have a, you know, a very, totally different you know, uh, perspective when it comes to uh, the company's ability to demonstrate their ESG performance. That means that you need to be 100% transparent with all your data points. You need to have, a, as, as Nicole said, a reporting, which is not only 
regulatory reporting, but you know to demonstrate that your company culture is driving beyond compliance all the time. And, uh, and, 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 and the final result of this is competitiveness. Uh, so, so to build competitiveness going forward in supply chains, which are much longer than how to say the shipping part of it, you need to demonstrate a firm commitment on how you are, you know, using your own organization, uh, building a com uh, culture beyond compliance when it comes to these issues. So I think that that is the kind of the big shift. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn. Um, Stavros, your thoughts. Yeah. What Good morning. Priorities. What do you think? Yeah. Good morning from uh, my side as well, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to have to share our views on that one. Um, indeed, the uh, EEG, uh, sustainable shipping, uh, is coming in our days uh, more and more in our uh, uh, top management agenda. Uh, already, Nicole and Bjorn um, uh, already referred to, we're talking about beyond compliance. And as, as you said correctly in your uh, introductory point, uh, ENG stands for environmental social governance. I think in our industry, which is heavily regulated with regards to um, uh, environmental regulations, we have already coped with, and we have to cope in the, uh, in the future as well, uh, in view of decarbonization initiatives, 2030, 2050, of course. Uh, but the most important thing is now that we see that we are taking and we will see this change to the social, we're talking about our rights and uh, especially for our assets on board our vessels. I'm talking about, about our people on board, our seafarers. And of course, with regards to governance, as Bjorn said, transparency. Uh, and of course, uh, allow me to say that uh, if you are a listed company, as we are, as, um, as uh, a listed company in uh, New York Stock Exchange and um, sort of companies, it's it's quite understandable, let's say, because you, we have to cope anyway, but for the industry will be a turning point that we have to uh, to see in the next, uh, the post-COVID area. So uh, in order to conclude, I would say that we are moving to a new mindset for the shipping industry after the, after, during the post-COVID era. Thank you. That's, uh, that's interesting because uh, I fully agree with what uh, Bjorn pointed out uh, when he started his statement that we've seen change within the last 12 months that we have not seen in the last, let's say, in the past 12 years. And this shift, as you said, it's, it's a new mindset. This is what we observe across the market. It may be, let's say, starting to gain momentum, let's say, to put, to put it in that sense. But uh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes on. Your views coming from the commercial part of the industry, dealing with uh, chartering issues and, you know, the commercial interest. What do you feel about the Poseidon principles and how do you see le the ESG, let's say, um, ap ap applied to the industry so far? Your views. Uh, Apostolos, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to share uh, our views and also to become more educated on something which is very new. Uh, as Mr. Maidani said, uh, this has come in uh, the last 12 months. Uh, uh, things that have not happened in the past 20 years that uh, uh, have been very close with the industry. I think that it's very important that we separate uh, the, the three elements of ESG. Environment is an issue that uh, shipping has taken uh, very largely into consideration for many years. Uh, we had uh, the uh, phase two uh, for, uh, for the tankers uh, with the double hull, uh, we addressed it. We had the water ballast treatment, uh, which we addressed it. We're addressing the IMO 2020 low sulfur, which already we're complying and it's proceeding very well. Uh, on the environment, I think that shipping is doing its best and we're trying also to decarbonize and we have a lot of things in the agenda, which in two minutes I cannot really you know, cover very quickly. On the social, I would also stress that shipping has been very close to the society and uh, addressing public issues and being close uh, 
uh, by helping the society as well, very, very much. Uh, things that we don't really see, we don't see publicized. Uh, I think most of the ship owners and most of the people involved in shipping uh, have the social welfare uh, in their minds. Uh, being crew, being their um, employees, being uh, just the society itself. A lot of care has been taken on that. On governance, I would also add to what Mr. Meidani said very correctly, that uh, ISM and all regulations that companies have to comply with, uh, cum, you know, being uh, a listed company, which gives you a lot more that you have to be uh, transparent and in compliance. I think this is another issue that uh, we have already addressed. So ESG today is not something very new, totally new. It's just wrapped up and packed in a, in a nice three letter uh, word, which is catchy. And it's not in shipping only, it's all across industries. So we have to comply, definitely. We are an industry and we have to comply as well as other industries. But I want to stress something. We're a small industry in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, very small. I'm sure. I'm sure we are. We are less than less than third percent of the of the global greenhouse gas emissions, but not insignificant. So I would like to let's say move the discussion forward. I would like to ask you to identify what should be the industry's let's say top priorities with respect to the ESG performance and sustainable shipping in general. Nicole. Well, I'm going to answer the question, but I'm also going to um, pick up a point that John had, uh, has just raised. Um, and, I'm, and I'm going to slightly disagree, John, when you separate the E and the S and the G. And the reason for that, there's a, there's a backing for this here, um, I think is best reflected in um, a roadmap that we've developed, which is called Roadmap to Sustainable Shipping Industry. And in this roadmap, we have six vision areas, we call them, which range from oceans, communities, um, transparency, finance, um, energy, people. They're all different elements, but really when you actually get into the roadmap, you look at the objectives and you look at the milestones specifically, of which there are 60 spread across those six vision areas, you realize that they're all interlinked. And the E goes with the S, goes with the G, goes with the S, goes with the E, and it's sort of like a whole mishmash, if you like, of lines. And an example could be, for instance, in the port communities, where you're addressing perhaps um, environmental related issues when it comes to marine fuels or shipping, but those coastal communities or indigenous communities, for instance, can be impacted. So just to make, make that point, I think, is, um, um, and as we continue the debate. Um, Just to add, I, don't, I don't disagree. Uh, we don't disagree. Okay. I totally agree. I can see you <laughs> nodding, so I'm happy. <laughs> That's okay. good. Um, I think in terms of um, priorities, so just uh, touching back on those milestones that I'd mentioned, it's, um, there are many opportunities when it comes to sustainable shipping, and it's very difficult to, to say one is more important than the other. I think clearly that decarbonization of shipping is the bell of the ball at the moment. Um, I think there's been a lot of progress there in terms of taking a lifestyle perspective to, um, to, emission, to emissions, but also considering decarbonization over a full life cycle perspective and including other sustainability issues such as land use change, um, human rights, um, air quality, water quality, and so on. Um, I think there's been a lot of, and I've mentioned the um, seafarers earlier, so I won't go into that again. Okay. Thanks. Uh, John? Yeah, so thank you. And, and I, I also have to comment on, on John in terms of your, your last statement saying that, you know, we are a small industry and we don't have very much impact, but, you know, we, we still have, you know, 2, 2.5 to 3% of the total emissions in the world that equals among uh, about the, the, the country of, of Germany. So, so just to put it in, uh, and we all need to reduce it with 50% within the next nine years in order to stay within the Paris Agreement. So it's a huge decarbonization which, uh, which need to go over all sectors, including shipping. Uh, because we also hope that within these nine years, the whole industry should grow. So, but, but this is the absolute numbers we need to reduce. So, 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 so I mean, the, the challenge is big, but this is also a huge opportunity, I think, for the shipping industry also to show that they are more competitive than, than land-based transportation. So, so, so to really move goods from, from land to sea, I think is, is a good opportunity. And in order to do so, we need investments and we need support. And uh, I think 
coming back to the one priority I think for the industry is really to start to collaborate uh, differently in order to be transparent. You need to be transparent. Transparency is trust. Transparency is everything. And when the financial community now is worried about, you know, everything committed to, you know, fossil fuel, um, that kind of, of issues, you need to de-risk the investment by being 100% transparent on where the industry are today, how you collaborate through the, through the supply chain and how you demonstrate, um, uh, how to say, uh, a, a, a culture of, of, of improvement. So it's a lot of initiative in the industry today about the data platforms and, and you know, different systems of, of, of bringing that uh, transparency in. And, and I would just encourage to continue because that transparency builds trust. And, and that trust is where the, the money is coming from. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, Stavros, your thoughts on the uh, industry's priorities in relation to ESG? Yeah, um, uh, I'm taking from uh, um, Nicole's point uh, rega regarding uh, the environmental uh, a challenge, um, a top uh, priority that we have. Yes, we have to and we will have to. Uh, follow and uh, comply and to cope with for sure first of all and, and at that point I would I would like to add one more um, a, a different aspect as well uh, because we are talking about huge huge investment that we have to make I'm talking about the ship owners that we have to make in order to comply with uh, John earlier said about the ballast uh, the um, implementation uh, of IMO 2020 we're talking about scrubbers we don't know the, the next uh, fuels, uh, fuel gen and generation of fuels or whatever it is. So we are talking about huge investments uh, to, to our new assets. I'm talking about vessels. So uh, we have to cope with environmental challenges from one side. On the other side, uh, there is, will, will be one uh, big issue with uh, the investment and the finance. On the other hand, I'm coming to the corporate governance, as uh, uh, Bjorn uh, mentioned as well, uh, about transparency and, uh, and everything, that we, are, we can see now that the finance holders have a specific um, interest of those companies that they are complying with EEG uh, principles. We have already the Poseidon principles that you mentioned uh, earlier. So, environmental and corporate governance, maybe they lead us as a challenge, as a priority to the discipline, a new discipline of finance. In simply words means that we have to, to see that in a strategic uh, uh, level, how we can uh, combine this kind of uh, aspects in uh, the near future. I'm talking about the next uh, eight, nine uh, years. Maybe I would like to also extend it a little bit further. I would say even faster than that, because what Bjorn said about the uh, transparency that will be bringing trust, which is common sense in business in these days, especially for all those listed companies and operators. And I can recall one, uh, I would say one of the, uh, of the biggest, let's say, uh, CEOs of uh, listed companies who said something that thick within my mind that we have to, to take care twice as careful the money of others, the money of the stakeholders and the shareholders and so on, than our money, which it does make sense about transparency, building trust in that sense. And we've seen sustainability linked uh, bonds and sustainability linked finance. And I'm sure we're going to see more. And I'm, I'm sure you will all agree in the, in the near future, not necessarily within the next, let's say five to 10 years, but even because Bjorn pointed out nicely at the beginning, even faster. So, John, what are your thoughts on the priorities from the, again, coming from the commercial perspective? From the commercial perspective, I think we are ahead of a heavy, very heavy, uh, serious, seriously heavy, more than one trillion investment of new technologies. This is an approximation, of course. Uh, Stavros mentioned, of course, scrubbers. We mentioned uh, I, uh, water ballast. We mentioned uh, a lot of investments that have already taken place and are taking place. 
but I think that the big investment is going to be alternative fuels, is going to be alternative propulsion on ships, uh, new designs. There's going to be a lot of change. I don't believe on the unmanned ship. We discussed that with Apostolos in the future, in the past, and we believe that this is something that uh, it may, may, maybe today is science fiction, totally science fiction. But let's consider what are the uh, uh, immediate uh, challenges that we have. We will be having uh, a lot of issues to comply with, and um, I think we have already complied with a lot of, uh, like uh, uh, DCS, uh, EU, MRV, uh, we have complied with the inventory of hazardous uh, materials as well. And we have so many uh, issues that we are taking care of that uh, this uh, ESG uh, right now is not just affecting the, 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 the ship per se. It's affecting everything. It's affecting chartering. It's affecting financing. It's affecting... Uh, I think we are, we're putting a lot of aspects in the same um, table. And I don't know if we're able to handle everything. Uh, if we are ready to, 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 to proceed uh, correctly and handle everything. Uh, I hear that uh, with the Poseidon principles, uh, there will be a difficulty and maybe uh, some companies will have no access to finance if their ESG rating is uh, subminimal. That is a big problem. Also the chartering principles as well, which uh, have, been, uh, have been also imposed uh, and proposed and slowly, slowly imposed. That will create problems. What happens if a vessel is substandard uh, in terms of its ESG rating and the company itself? What will happen there? I mean, these are issues that we, we, we have to address because 90% of cargoes are carried by ships. The most economical way, we all know this. This is common sense for shipping people. Is the alternative. How will we cope if ESG ready, companies are not ESG, are not ESG ready and they cannot be? In, in, in a short period. I think we need time to digest. And I have a lot of ideas and opinions about it, which we can address, you know, on, on, on as we go ahead, uh, Apostolos. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. We've seen, I would like to just point out something that we've seen a couple of days ago in the press with Shell, one of the oil majors in the market, coming forward and, 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 and they say, would like to decarbonize 50% of our emissions within the next chartered fleet within the next, I think, three years, something like that. And again, they pointed out we would like to, they order, a, 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 I think, a group of 10 ships with LNG as a fuel. I mean, we've seen charters not only walk, not only saying some, but walk the talk. We, we would like to just see, I understand what you're saying, but we, we as an industry, we're not ready yet to, def, to define what the ESG ready means. Because what you said was something about ESG ready. This is, it takes a lot of discussion, but we'll see how we, how we move forward. Now, I would like to go back to, to Nicole, and I would like to ask, uh, what are the ESG changes that you're noticing across the performance of the industry stakeholders? What different are we starting to notice? Because John pointed out something about the financial institutions asking for ESG ready. We're not sure what ESG ready means. What do you notice across the industry? I think both John and Bjorn have, uh, have highlighted this in different ways. And it's, um, I'm jumping on the word here, Bjorn, forgive me, but the transparency I think is, is something really strongly emerging. And the ESG ratings are of course connected to that, right? Because it's about disclosure of data and they're actually using the data for business decisions. Um, I think that's connected to a bigger picture. Um, I might say connecting more dots in people's minds. Um, and really looking at um, sustainable supply chains more holistically. And that's where you have the charterers, the financial sector, that's really, um, they themselves are getting scrutinized by their own customers, right? And then they're starting to look at their own supply chains and saying, well, hang on. And this isn't just for decarbonization, right? We're seeing this for the, in the case of the, the seafarers, labor and human rights risks as well. And they're saying, well, we, this is part of our supply chain and we need to account for human rights across our supply chain all the way through, all the way through. Um, I think that's, that's quite exciting. I, I get it and I agree, John, it's, it's a massive challenge. I don't know whether it's a matter of we need more time because shipping is an industry, as we've seen, that um, tends to wait for regulation before changing. So we're, we're wanting to be proactive and really hoping that that bar can be raised and raised further. Um, 
but we're also under enormous pressure because it's not only the charterers, the financial sector and their customers, but it's the general public. Um, there's an awakening and it's a very, very fast awakening more and more that's, that wants to know what's going on in those supply chains and that's pushing their, you know, their retailers, the, the sneakers they're wearing, the, the, the furniture they're setting up in their home. They're asking, how did this get to me? In what form? What are the conditions? Um, and I think that's a, we find that a very exciting trend because that's going to, as I mentioned, the bar, that's going to push that bar, not slowly, but I think pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Bjorn, your thoughts? <clears throat> Yeah, my, my first thought is that I 100% agree to, to Nicole. And uh, so thank you for bringing that so, so clearly for us. And um, um, I, I, I think it is important also what you said that, you know, I've I'm, I'm been working with it, this industry for, for almost 30 years and you've all been part of it for, for many years. So, and, and, you know, we, we are not normally, historically, been very proactive in moving forward on, on new regulations. Uh, I've been discussing fatigue requirements with, uh, with the Greek shipping communities 20 years ago. And uh, you know, it was a lot of hard discussions before we finally agreed to, to move forward. On the other side, the industry as such has been very uh, effective in the sense that we have moved together. We have moved together. So that when we move, first move, the impact is big. But, but as Nicole said, things are shifting now and, um, and, and we are not, how to say, in control anymore of our own uh, chain because it is cargo owners, it is investors, it is people, uh, it is also about competitive positioning. So, so it is within the shipping industry also you see no players. Who, who rapidly understand this and, and will, I think, not longer move together with the rest of the industry, but they will leapfrog in order to, to somehow build positions, deliver services, which the cargo owners with the investors would like to see because they are much more transparent, they're much more energy efficient and they are able to show it. So, so again, I think we, the industry, my, my call to action for the industry in such case is to look at this as a big opportunity because it is big monies waiting for those who are able to do this forcefully, correctly and proactively. Thank you. Okay, uh, Stavros, your thoughts on the <clears throat> notices that we've seen across the industry on the, 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 the change in way that the stakeholders, uh, let's say, Behave. Yeah, um, I would say I would say that uh, okay. What we're talking about in our industry stakeholders, we're talking about the charters, the monitors, the owners, the the financiers, and of course the public uh, already. So, based on the interest of each stakeholder, if we'd like to, to discuss and go back to the three pillars again of the ESG, based on their interest. Uh, we, we will see the reactions on uh, on each subcategory of each pillar based on their interest. Um, so um, you mentioned, uh, for example, Shell uh, earlier, and uh, this is something that uh, a big oil major that uh, they charter our vessels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are moving uh, from that side, and uh, uh, when Nicole mentioned. Uh, uh, mentioned a couple of things during her, uh, her last uh, statement. I was thinking, uh, must be nine or ten years back. Uh, I was in London, and uh, I remember that uh, I don't mention the, the company. It was a cup of coffee, very famous. It said that uh, this cup of coffee and this content is uh, the carbon food, uh, the, the coffee that you're drinking right now. The carbon carbon footprint is. Uh, X, Y, Z percent or because we are transferring from Brazil or whatever it was. And that was the first, let's say, um, aspects and the idea about the carbon footprint, the sustainable, the sustainability and how we are careful about. It was 10 years back, I remember. I don't know if... Uh, so this is something that we have to 
and to, uh, to, uh, to make this across the supply chain. And our position and our role will be one part of this huge supply chain in the future. Yeah. Um, Stavros, by the way, we've seen recently the publication of the Poseidon principles specifically for crew change and crew welfare. And that was in it I just, this is in contrast to what I said about the example again of Shell. This is not the idea of let's say pointing out names, but Shell is a best practice example of how they move forward with the carbonization. Okay. And I've heard a lot of complaints across the industry. We heard that uh, in our talks and forums in the past, I would say six to eight months about uh, big cargo owners and charterers and you know big names, listed companies, that they do not want to deviate the ships in order to affect crew changes. And that was the need for the Poseidon principle for the crew change because crew changes is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue for me. As Nicole pointed out in her opening statement about the human element. Uh, are you a signatory, is capital a signatory to this uh, Poseidon principle? And are you having any sort of experience, any sort of problems with crew changes? This is what I would like to ask because we've seen inconsistencies between, again, big policies and, you know, walking the talk. Yes, um, no, uh, actually, uh, although the uh, 2020 was very, very hard year for all of us, uh, uh, no, I would say that uh, we didn't face. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, pardon? Any on that? Sorry, I miss you. You didn't have any, any sort of problems? No, no, we didn't face. I, I mean, uh, with a mutual uh, agreement and uh, discussions, we tried to do our best. Maybe it was our case. We didn't face any specific problems. But in that point, I would like to say that, uh, again, uh, without trying, um, trying to blame nobody, uh, during 2020, we, we, as an industry, we, we took uh, uh, measures very late about our people on board. So, so our people uh, already there and we, we as an industry continue to discuss and say and say and uh, have thoughts and discussions and our people were there. So it's our blame, it's nobody's, nobody else's blame, it's our blame. I understand what you're saying, yeah. I've seen, I've heard it in the past and understand what you're saying, fully, fully understand what you're saying. Uh, it's not the point of, you know, finger pointing, it's the point of uh, addressing, yeah, that these are industry uh, weaknesses that we all have to accept and address. Uh, yeah. Your thoughts on the, what changes we notice across the industry with respect to ESG, uh, across stakeholders? What are your views? You mentioned about financial institutions, what else do you see? Uh, also, uh, as I said, and also the um, uh, the charters. I see uh, we will see uh, steadily uh, the charters will uh, have additional uh, requirements uh, regarding uh, this approach. So uh, I, I I believe that uh, all these challenges will be in front of us. Okay. Okay. I understand that, John. Your thoughts. <clears throat> Um, I am a bit puzzled. I'm a bit puzzled really to have uh, concise thoughts in two minutes, really. It is such a vast uh, topic that I think two minutes really creates just an elevator pitch, which is, you know, a, a fast elevator pitch going uh, 100 stories up. But anyway, let, let me not waste more time uh, by explaining this. Uh, I think that ESG performance is now correlated to traditional shipping industry risks. And uh, that includes accidents, includes vessels, detentions, uh, pollution incidents, and financial loss uh, due to uh, fines or reputational damage. I think it's also linked to new emerging risks uh, related to corporate governance and social factors. Uh, this is ESG. And uh, we have to define how sustainable uh, the business is and um, the company's ability to access financing as well is affected, as we mentioned. As a result, I feel that investors now look uh, to integrate ESG-related risk factors in their uh, investment processes. 
just uh, like any other uh, risk uh, factor. And um, of course, this comes down to ESG ratings, um, uh, which is going to be performed by agencies, by, by, by companies, by organizations. I don't know. I, 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 really, I really don't have a clear picture. And I would like maybe some of our panelists or maybe Apostolos, if you know better, who is going to rank the ESG performance of targeted companies. And uh, of course, this is going to be uh, based on publicly available information. Uh, are we going to be compliant uh, and, uh, and, and feeding regularly with information? I think this is something also that uh, Greek ship owners uh, are not ready yet uh, to, to, to be totally transparent. Of course, the listed companies is a different uh, category, but uh, the traditional uh, medium-sized Greek shipping company, uh, I don't know how ready they are to um, you know, expose. This is something that uh, will take uh, a lot of time, probably, to soak in well and in the Greek uh, community, which I can express my thoughts better, Fab. We don't have only, let's say, the Poseidon principles. There are a couple of other standards, let's say, more or less standards in the market. And what we've seen so far, I would like to hear from Bjorn as well, because he has extensive, vast experience with, with DNV. Now it's DNV, DNV GL in the past. Now it's coming back to DNV. And, uh, uh, We've seen third-party assurance providers being the, the, the organization providing some type of assurance. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've done that in the past with the NV. Um, definitely, definitely. And, and as Jan said, it, it's not a clear picture. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's so many standards out there. And, and obviously that is a challenge for the industry. Uh, maybe the, the big players can 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 deal with it, but but for for smaller companies, it's obviously a, a challenge. Yeah. But I would like to point uh, to at least the, the Norwegian Ship Owner Association. They they made last year a kind of a how to see a, a recommended ESG standard for the shipping industry, uh, which is. Uh, which at least in Norway, I see a lot of the companies are, are using that as a framework for their reporting. So, so again, it's, it's coming back to this, instead of, of, of sitting and see the investor communities and rating communities, you know, defining the agenda. I think, you know, the, the shipping industry should be more proactive. And if you come together and say that within our industry, we believe this is the kind of the, the most important parameters we would like to be transparent on. Uh, at least that is that is a strong signal uh, to the to the rest of the stakeholders that you are you are on to it. Mm. Uh, because I think for many years you will see different standards. Uh, so, 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 so that picture will not be, be clear. But but as an industry to really kind of unite around some principles, I think is, is, is a good way forward. Yeah, Nicole? If I may um, jump in, I'd, um, I hear you, John. I think it is a, a dilemma, the number of different, um, first of all, ratings frameworks um, and the number of reporting that you have to go you know, against all of them. And I think there's looking at the, not shipping specific, but in the sustainability world, when you're looking at sustainability reporting standards, you had the, the Global Reporting Initiative, the GRI framework um, that I understand now, and I was reading recently, it's looking to be um, harmonizing and they're working with SASB, the Sustainability Account Standards Board. I think that's the correct acronym. Um, but it's really trying to understand how those, because even in general sustainability reporting, there are different frameworks. So I think there's at least a demand and a push from companies that are saying there's too many, there's too many standards, there's too much reporting. There's an attempt to harmonize in the sustainability reporting. And of course, what's disclosed in that sustainability reporting is then used by the ESG rating agencies. So I, I agree with you, it's not straightforward and it can be enough to make a, a, a smaller, medium-sized shipping company's head spin. Um, but I, I think, and I think it's safe to say, there's a, certainly a demand and movement to hopefully harmonize and, you know, and, and synthesize a bit um, all of these different frameworks. Uh, let's hear from Stavros. Stavros, your thoughts on how you manage, because this is one of, one of your, let's say, hats you are wearing, one of the roles you have, that you have to, to deal with is being the Chief Sustainability Officer for a listed group of companies. How do you manage this on the different standards that you have to report and prepare reports and, you know, handle this? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is uh, one of our main concerns, my main concerns, of our main concerns here right now, because 
as already uh, or, already mentioned, uh, Nicole uh, mentioned very very uh, uh, accurately. Um, we have the GRI, okay, and uh, some other standards, and uh, we have uh, due to the nature of our company a lot of data uh, complying with several um, requirements. But the question is again. And uh, you know me, Apostolos, I'm a supporter of having clear instructions, uh, clear um, uh, standards, whatever it is, in order to, to try to comply with. And of course, on the other hand, we need to know who is responsible to assess. Right now, I would, first of all, I would, like, I, I would prefer to have something specific for our industry would be very, very helpful in order to, uh, to solve this issue, as we already uh, said, that, okay, for the, the big players, for uh, the listed companies that we are quite aware and familiar with, what about the others? So if we have a harmonized a standard for our industry, yes, we have to deal and we have to cope and we have to comply. Otherwise, will be very, very difficult because after that, we have different levels of implementation, rating, preferred suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, we, we're going to face issues with the market as such, the commercial side I'm talking about. So this is our concern that we are working on. Uh, if, if you ask me, I don't have clear um, pictures right now. We are collecting, we have a lot of things. We are trying to find what, what's going on and how we're going to report in a proper way, because we have to, and we need, and we have to be, and we want to be transparent, what we, plan, what, what we are publishing, for sure. John, John is posing the questions, and everyone else is trying to answer. John is, is you know, is posing the, the right questions. I would like to ask now, uh, again, uh, uh, Apostolos, before before you ask, before you ask, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to clarify my mind aloud. You know, it's uh, not uh, putting questions, and you know, having experts. I'm not the expert. Uh, I, I, my expertise is selling ships and uh, buying ships, not for myself, for for as an intermediary, as a broker, of course. Right. But uh, I, I like to hear the uh, uh, I, because this is a challenging issue. I can tell you one thing. I asked as a sample. 10 medium-sized ship owners. What is ESG today? Mm-hmm. Yesterday, actually. What is ESG? How many knew what is ESG? None. Two out of 10 thought it's uh, something in the car, you know, like enhanced uh, stability, whatever. Uh, another two... John, uh, we said, have work to do. <laughs> <laughs> another two mentioned that uh, maybe uh, something with regulations. Okay, that's good, you know, right direction. Another two uh, mentioned uh, no clue. They were honest. And another two, t- tr- another two tried to Google, you know, while I-, I-, I asked the question. I could understand that they had no clue again. So obviously, you know, ESG is new and we have to address it. But I can tell you, the more people hear and learn about it, and I think we have to be educated about it. We have to learn more. Nicole, you have more to do and uh, Bjorn as well. You know, we have to be educated. Uh, the listed companies, of course, become easier educated because they're more open into the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, and more open to transparency and more open to having to comply. But I think the medium-sized brick ship owner uh, is here to comply, definitely, because it will be for his benefit. It will be for the benefit of the society and for the benefit of the industry. And I can tell you something which I pointed out doing some reading. Uh, because COVID-19 is, uh, of course, you know, here. It's still here. It will be here probably on the down curve, hopefully, and let's be optimistic about it. But a recent uh, analysis, I think by uh, HSBC, um, showed not in shipping, but in in globally, uh, that companies with high ESG ratings were more resilient to the economic shocks that were caused by COVID-19 during uh, the lockdowns. And I think this is quite important because uh, they also mentioned that uh, although the global stock markets uh, had experienced significant downturn, Stocks of companies with a strong ESG performance uh, outperformed the market throughout uh, 2020. So that was quite impressive because this trend was noticed in most global markets and more in the Asia Pacific uh, region. This is, I point this out because, you know, this is something that we see already being mature in other industries. 
uh, as ESG is not new to uh, the other industries. And I think shipping is going to benefit as well, not just the stocks of the listed companies, but in generally uh, the organizing of, uh, of, of, of the better monitoring and KPIs that we will be able to monitor. And pointing something very, very small, and I'm uh, finishing here, uh, the research and development of technologies is going to pay a big, big, big respect, I think, to all the data collection, uh, automated data collection systems, which have to be or are installed in the ships, because that is the future. Real-time data collection that we will be able to monitor and we will be able to have uh, first-hand information of how to reduce uh, emissions by reducing speed, by reducing uh, RPMs, by optimizing, and I think optimization has to come also uh, in real time, uh, not just by new designs, but with the existing ships. It will take a lot of time to replace all these ships. So I think we have to do a lot of R&D in uh, modifying uh, and, and, and optimizing. I think this is the, the key, the key uh, word. And I will come down to uh, Bjorn's big opportunity. I feel all challenges create opportunities. And this is a big opportunity, not because of a one trillion industry that we are opening, but uh, all challenges create opportunities and we have to be proactive. I use yeah. again Bjorn's words. Yeah, uh, Stavros, yes. Yes, uh, a very quick comment from exactly what uh, John just said. Uh, so we are coming again, if I understood uh, correctly, uh, John's comment, again, to a new mindset and because what uh, John described, he said clearly, we are not, not talking about the shares of these EEG high rating companies. We are talking about a new mindset from one side and the other side, again, we are talking and we, are, we have in front of us, generally speaking, the innovation in our industry, which is quite familiar for us. We are talking about very good, very modern uh, state-of-the-art uh, assets regarding innovative uh, equipment on board. But we are talking about also innovation, how we manage with new technologies, the digitalization, and all this, which is in front of us. Yeah, yeah. Just a, a quick comment from me uh, for what John said, and going back to what Bjorn said. I think Bjorn pointed out in his, I mean, I think uh, at some point he pointed out the, the point of competitiveness, because, you know, this transparency brings trust and everything goes at the end of the day, sustainability is about competitiveness in the long term. And I don't want to put, let's say, the horse before the cart. I think that most probably is about competitiveness and these competitive companies being more resilient and the competitive companies who are more resilient, they have a better ESG performance, to put in that sense. All the, all the surveys are pointing out some issues and maybe having a different angle of approach. But I think that at the end of the day is what Bjorn pointed out earlier. It's about competitiveness and there's the resilience and, and everything. And the, John, with what you said, we have to, let's say, again, ask my next question. Uh, what are the sectors of the industry that you see mostly affected? I understand the issue of the social footprint, those who are listed, those who are in the business to consumer, like the containers, the cruise. What, I understand the big charters. What other parts of the industry you see affected? Do you see any sort of impact from the, or to the ports? Do you see any sort of, let's say, uh, other parts of the industry being affected. I understand the large operators. How about the smaller ones? Nicole, what, what do you see? What is the feedback you get from the market? You know, I mean, a uh, fairly short answer, to be honest, because uh, all will be affected in some shape or another. Um, I mean, we've touched on a few different areas here, you know, when it comes to, to seafarers, right, to decarbonization. But we, you know, if you look at the entire ship life cycle, if we think about um, the design and building of ships, um, the operation, the end of life, the dismantling and recycling, all of these stages, all of the players in these different stages of the life cycle will be affected in one shape or another. But what's clear, and I think we've all made the same Stavros and John, and, and we've all said the same point here, and Apostolos, you said it as well, it's the resilient, it's the um, sustainability first movements, um, the ESG champions, if you like, they are the ones that, in the long term, it's very clear, are going to, to be the winner, if you like. Um, so it's all will be affected, but it's what each player does with, with that, really. Okay. Bjorn, any quick thoughts yeah. on that? 
Yeah, no, I, I think it is, you know, um, industry for industry, what we are into is the need of a systemic change. Uh, so, so, so it's 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 about you know doing things here and there, but but it is to 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 get that mindset, which Stav was also mentioned that in order to to reach these goals, uh, for instance, the the environmental goals or other goals, you know, you need to have this understanding that you need a systemic change, and and that's why I also agree with Nicole. It's it's hard to point on one because. They all need to be be part of that 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 transformation, and um, um, and and once you start that that kind of narrative, I think you 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 fuel it with a lot of of opportunities because you know different stakeholders start to talk with each other with a different language. I would also say that, as Jon said, it is a lot about technologies and. Um, so to really invite in players from other industry, from, from technology vendors into the industry to, to, to assist you to, to drive efficiency, to drive transparency, to drive effectiveness, to really use technologies across the value chain. I think a lot of things might happen. So, so and, and, and I think for the, for, the, for the shipping industry, which are the most international industry we have, the most global industry we have, you know, you're so attractive uh, to, to invite in, in uh, you know, uh, other industries, technology providers to work on, on efficiency, on effectiveness, on transparency. So, so I think that holistic view uh, is, is the most important and to start to communicate that. We all need to work together in order to do a systemic change. Okay, thank you. Stavros, your thoughts? Yes. Yeah, um, again, I think that uh, will be across the, the supply, the whole supply chain, and uh, each player uh, factor of, uh, of uh, this supply chain has to or, or will take. Uh, this part of interest of the EEG. You mentioned the ports. We are talking about vessels, the ports with uh, more environmental uh, regulations for the vessels, for example, calls those ports. And what about the, uh, the also uh, the social um, aspect of the companies that they have business with the ports, etc., etc. We have already seen, in especially in Nordic uh, area, uh, a few um, successful examples. Um, as far as it concerns, just um, uh, a point, as far as it concerns the specific sectors that we are operating our vessels, I believe that uh, the liners, the containers, for sure, is on the first line, this part of segment, regarding the, um, uh, the implementation, also tankers, we already discussed. Of course, the, the cruising. Um, we heard, okay, before the COVID-19 uh, issues and uh, a pandemic uh, that uh, in our days, the potential passengers, clients, let's say, they are, they are making the, deci the decision-making process includes also the EEG or the carbon footprint uh, impact based on the company, which vessel, which company they are going to choose in order to make their cruise, or et cetera, et cetera. We saw that in the past. So each player in the supply chain will make a, will create a, make a specific role and uh, play an important role on that one. Okay, John? Difficult to, 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 to pinpoint, but I tried as hard as I can maybe to, 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 to reduce to, you know, some highlights, some, some key highlights out of this. I think that uh, our most immediate challenge is to reduce carbon emissions. It's the, the main and most, uh, and most important uh, challenge that we have. Um, um, I think that also financiers, uh, through the Poseidon uh, principles, uh, it, I feel that they attach more importance to sustainability issues than what operators do at this point of time now. Um, also, uh, ship finance banks uh, have uh, a limited appetite in funding new clean technology upgrades themselves. 
um, I think this is uh, this is uh, something that will increase in the future, and um, uh, we feel that decarbonization um, is setting to drive greater cooperation among uh, industry participants. I think this is uh, cooperation. It's a matter of cooperation. All parties have to cooperate. Uh, it is not the chartering, uh, the sea cargo charter, that uh, will create a block or a stop uh, to uh, non-ESG uh, companies. I think it ha there has to be a cooperation. There has to be an incentive. Already we see in chartering, of course, and uh, uh, Stavros, uh, he can also uh, give us uh, a thumbs up that uh, an echo cape size today obtains a greater premium than a non-echo. Uh, it's, it's a matter of mathematics, of course, you know, less consumption of fuel. So the charter will pay premium for uh, a less thirsty vessel. And uh, I think this this goes down to, uh, to, to to funding of clean technology and fuel uh, research. Uh, I feel also that ship owners are wary, wary today of committing to many new green technologies. Still, some of these green technologies are unknown and not tested. And they seem like uh, guinea pigs, you know, investing in technologies that they will be the first to do. I think this is quite important also that uh, the more people come in, the more momentum uh, will be generated and uh, not uh, the first uh, person will feel that I'm the guinea pig, you know, I'm testing these new technologies. I think this is something that we will have to, 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 to see. So that's why I mentioned it's about time and we need time, time to mature. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, I have to, let's say, roll out our last question because we'll be out of time. I'd like you to, let's say, sum up your thoughts and I would like to ask you, um, are there any best practices and lessons to be learned either from the past or from other industries as we move forward with the sustainability agenda? What are your thoughts on that, Nicole? This is a great question. I like this one because it's all about collaboration, partnerships and learning, which is a lot of what we're about at uh, the Sustainable Shipping Initiative. Um, a couple of examples, um, and I won't spend as much time on the fast because we've covered a lot of decarbonization in this conversation. But I think what we've, uh, what we've seen in our work around uh, defining sustainability criteria for uh, marine fuels, for the future zero and low carbon marine fuels, um, we see aviation as having some experience there that, uh, that shipping can learn from. And certainly from a regulatory perspective, um, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, has done some work on this area, in this area, um, and they've defined a, a couple of criteria already, a sustainability criteria for uh, aviation fuels. Um, and that's something I think that shipping, you know, the IMO, International Maritime Organization, can also be looking at. Um, another interesting example, and I touched on this earlier when it comes to the ship life cycle perspective, um, something that's really interesting and I think is um, we need to, to really look, look at further is looking at um, circularity and the principles around the circ circular economy and closed loop. Um, and an example of this is if we look at the automotive industry. So we look at cars and they're looking at the recycling, the reuse, uh, the reconditioning, the repurposing of their different components of a vehicle. And I think that's something that shipping can really learn from the automotive industry and think about all the way back in the design phase and say, how can we design a vessel that makes it easier, that makes it better to either reuse, repurpose, recycle different components and materials. Um, there's a lot of learning there. We don't need to start from scratch. Um, of course, they're different industries, but there are parallels that we can benefit from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We don't have to start from scratch. Bjorn. Yeah, so great question. And, and my very kind of specific recommendation, as we have discussed a lot about ESG reporting, I would again point to this guideline uh, developed by the, by the Norwegian Ship Owner Association. I think that is a good, good starting point and, and, and you can use it and you can, you can modify it if needed, but, but that is a good, good starting point. And then Coming back to your question, uh, this is about shaping in the industry a different mindset for, for the decade of action, which is basically where we are now, uh, reducing our emission 50%, complying with the UN sustainability goals, which are about social goals and, and uh, environmental goals and all of that. And so my recommendation to 
for one industry to learn from, I would go first and foremost to the financial in industry. I would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would really understand how they look at risk, how they look at uh, investments going forward, how they, they, they see, see the, their, how to say, requirement or needs for the shipping industry to comply with in short and medium uh, term. I, I think, I think that, that will be to have a systemic, uh, discussion with that industry will be very much important. And then I fully agree to, to Nicole, the automotive industry are in a full transformation. That gives you a good indication for what the shipping industry will be into the next uh, decade. It's not, not only in the automotive industry about electrification, which get a lot of attention. It's, it's about making the cars connected you know a car is not longer a car it is the is the business model of owning a car you know renting a car and all of that there's a lot to learn from that so so that is the industry i would like to attach and then john you will see that autonomous ships are not that far away either okay Stavros. uh yes um I would say that, yeah, um, for sure, uh, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, as we used to say. Uh, we have best practices from other industries, from other sectors, sorry, like uh, aviation already mentioned, automotive. Yes, we have already um, adapted quite, uh, quite a lot of practices. We made regulations, uh, uh, rules, uh, class rules, whatever it is. Yes, now, Nicole, we have from cradle to grave regarding the recycling. We have finally, finally, I would say, uh, some kind of convention standard to follow. I'm talking about the industry, of course. We have some steps to, 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 to do uh, further. But again, uh, closing, because as, as I said, uh, it's a lot of things that uh, we have already. And we will, because shipping industry is an open, I believe, it's an open-minded uh, industry, uh, not easy to adapt, but at the end, we are adapting. We are adapting for sure. So partnership, communication, education with regards to sustainability and EEG approach will be the, the key for the next, uh, for the next years. These three partnerships, communication, education. Thank you, thank you, Stavro, very much. Uh, John, yes, yes, a quick comment, yes. Yeah, uh, you know, as we are, you know, uh, landing this discussion, I would also kind of emphasize that uh, I think it is so much competence and so much knowledge and know-how in the industry. So, so obviously you can learn from others, but, but, but uh, I think you should also, I think the industry should have great confidence in you know, what we are doing today, what we have done for the last hundred years, and, and, and you know, no, uh, yeah, not lose that confidence because it's that confidence which has brought the shipping industry to where it is today. And, uh, and, and it's that confidence and leadership which is within the industry which need to, to bring it through the ne next decades as well. So it's, it's good to learn from others but it is important to stay confident with the knowledge the industry have already. Absolutely, absolutely. John, your thoughts? Um, I will start with Nicole's comment on the um, automotive industry. I touched it before, you know, just uh, very uh, uh, rapidly. But uh, I would like to comment that if, if uh, what I read recently uh, about the automotive industry, that by 2030, uh, which is not very far away from today, uh, they feel and they have an expectation that there will be no internal combustion engine car in the streets. That's very radical, you know, to say in 19, uh, sorry, sorry, in, uh, in, in, in nine years, uh, sorry, in 2035, they were saying, that's 14 years from today. It's a short time to say all electrics. And how will you feed these electric cars? The electricity produced, does it have an energy, clean energy footprint? Is it produced from coal? Is it produced from alternative sources? Is it totally clean? We don't know. And that's a challenge again. I think we need time to become ready. 
I think we have to also uh, embrace changes. Change is good, always. I like changes. And the transition that we will have to form from sustainability to ESG performance simply indicates that we have to mature business practices and to be able to have uh, more precise measurements of uh, portfolio uh, performance. I think our industry becomes more sophisticated and uh, as this happens, we need to improve, simply improve the way that we collect and track metrics and uh, to build ESG management accordingly. I think we will be talking about ESG managers more and more in companies now. I think this will be uh, a very hot topic. Managing ESGs and uh, teams in companies managing ESGs. And I think this is the future that we will see. As I said again, and I will uh, finish with this, a change is always good. Uh, we want to have changes. In our industry, the worst thing that we can have is flat, something which is totally flat. We like to have ups and downs and we have to have shocks and changes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, John, for your last comment. I would like to thank you all very much. Um, I found, uh, I would like to thank you for bringing this uh, both informative and provocative views. Uh, in our discussion. I would like to uh, thank all our viewers and uh, we are looking forward to seeing you in one of our future talks. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Apostolos. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.